This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello, and welcome or welcome back to Self Work to actually this 209th episode of self-work, which is hard to believe. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I began self-work more than four years ago to try to address some of the issues that still seem confusing to people about therapy. I wanted to reach those of you who might already be in therapy and be very comfortable with psychological and emotional issues. To those of you who might have just been diagnosed with depression or anxiety or some other kind of mental illness, or you're having a relationship problem that seems daunting. But also to those of you who might say, I'd never darken the door of a therapist, but you're just curious enough to listen in to someone like me. So welcome to all of you. And some of you who recently told me once again, you know, there's a fourth group, those of us who can't afford therapy and really need podcasts like this. So I really am glad all of you are here. Trust is something that may initially seem like it's given or perhaps more honestly, it's earned by others. But as I looked up learning to trust, I found article after article with some great tips on learning how to trust someone else. And I'll have one of the ones I found that I really like in the show notes today by Andrea Bonoir, a professor at Georgetown, who includes things on her list such as learning to be vulnerable, but doing it gradually, making sure you feel respected, and having the expectation that people will state their feelings without having the agenda to shame or hurt you. But as I looked around these lists, I realized that first and foremost, trust has to begin inside yourself. Because if you question yourself constantly or worry that what you believe has little merit, and you're pretty well left with so much self-doubt that you won't make a move or decision in any direction. A little bit of self-doubt can be a good thing. It can help you slow down and rethink or wonder if something is what it seems or if what you're about to do isn't such a hot idea. Too much, however, is not helpful. So today we're going to talk about that, learning how to trust your gut, when you can do it, when you better not do it. We're going to feature a theory by Kahneman, and I'll break his theory down into five steps. He has three questions that you think you should ask, and so I just break that down a little further for you. And then five things that I thought of all by myself (laughs) about trusting your gut. The listener email today is one that immediately piqued my attention and really deserves its own podcast. What do you do when you begin to believe therapy not only isn't helping, but is harming you in some way? Sometimes I hesitate to talk about this because I so believe in the good that therapy can do. But not all therapy is helpful. And if the therapist gets lost in their own agenda or is somehow playing out their own issues through you, then actual harm can be done. We'll start at least by featuring this listener's experience, and I'll give you a quick and dirty answer with more to come. So let's sit back and let's talk about your gut, the one that sometimes you want to trust and sometimes maybe you shouldn't. I was fascinated by the book Blink when it came out by Malcolm Gladwell. He explained in it what he termed thin slicing or going with your gut, getting a tiny piece of information that's very fast and then acting almost without thought as you follow that instinct, that tiny piece of information. In fact, he opens the book with a story about an ancient and highly acclaimed statue that had arrived at a museum for display. But the curator who got the first shot of looking at it had an immediate reaction. This statue was a fake. And sure enough, it was. Although it had been touted by world experts as quite a gem. He goes on to discuss various situations where using intuition or seeming improvisation actually leads to success. I'll quote a short summary of his book. In short, Gladwell suggests that rapid cognition isn't inherently good or bad. Sometimes thin slicing helps us make insightful judgments about others, and sometimes it may lead us to stereotype. However, by controlling the process of thin slicing just a little, 
For example, by training police officers to interpret facial cues more accurately, by introducing blind auditions for musicians, we can use rapid cognition to make the world fairer and safer. I'll obviously have the link to both that short summary of his book as well as to his book in the show notes. But there's also a very renowned Nobel-winning psychologist named Kahneman, who's an Israeli psychologist and economist, notable for his work on the psychology of judgment and decision-making. He actually won the 2002 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences because of his work in behavioral economics. But in the same year, he wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. It was published and became a bestseller. I found his work fascinating as well. Kahneman's problem with gut instincts, or what he termed our brain's fast-thinking system one, is that it relies on rules of thumb that often turn out to be wildly wrong. Why? Because we try to figure out how likely something is to happen by how many examples of it we can remember. Just think about that. That's likely to cause you to grossly overestimate the occurrence of something that's actually quite rare. So our intuition is often wrong. It's our minds trying to use a shortcut that actually ends up as a dead end or simply wrong. That is, unless, he says, you can answer yes to three specific questions. Then you can trust your gut. After all, most of us have had an experience, I know I have many times as a therapist, of knowing what someone is going to say before they say it, even if it's something you've never heard them say. You have a gut instinct or You turn in a certain direction that you think, I think this is the way, or whatever it is. But we all have gut instincts, right? But here are the three questions. Is there actually some regularity in this area you can pick up and learn? He says intuition develops from experience. So your gut has to be able to spot trends and patterns that are reliable, that actually exist. He would say, for example, chess players can have intuition. Married people certainly have it. However, something like the stock market is simply too noisy and irregular for anyone to understand on gut instinct alone. Here's a second question. Have you had a lot of practice in this area? Again, successful intuitions or going with your gut are born of long observation of environments with some level of pattern and regularity. Good gut instincts therefore require a lot of practice. And we're not talking about just a few weeks. We're talking about years. And then the third question is, Do you receive immediate feedback in the area? Practice isn't just about doing something over and over again. In fact, really, the best kind of practice is the kind that you get immediate and concrete feedback. So you can train your intuition if you get this kind of feedback. Another source I found called this deliberate practice, where you aren't just practicing, you're always trying to improve. You may even have a mentor who in your eyes has attained that expertise And all of that experience in practicing and immediate feedback can lead you to trusting your gut more. So the next time your gut is screaming at you to do or not do something, take a moment and check in with science. Is this an area where patterns actually exist? Do you have years of experience with the subject? And have you tested your gut against reality previously? If you can't answer yes to all three of these, you might want to use more rationale. So let's stop for a second and digest all of this and allow me to remind you of a fabulous offer from BetterHelp in a time when so many of us need support and guidance for facing situations that we've never faced before. Here's BetterHelp. BetterHelp has now been a sponsor of Self Work for a few months, and I've been hearing how pleased you are with their services. I couldn't be more excited about that, as by now you know I'm a huge believer myself in the power of therapy. What is BetterHelp? It's an online therapy service that has earned the number one ranking for the quality of their service to their consumers. When you contact them, you are offered several different licensed professional therapists to choose from, all that have been vetted by BetterHelp. You can have sessions via video, text, or phone, and I found, because of course I checked it out before recommending it to you, that each therapist was very available, literally a text away, and made some of the same therapeutic suggestions to me that I'd offer myself as a therapist. Here's an excerpt from a listener who wrote in, I'm a 23-year-old living in Brazil. I'm only writing this message in order to express my gratitude towards you and your podcast. 
having anxiety disorder, I always felt like I needed therapy, but I was too anxious to start it. With self-work, not only I've learned some valuable insights about dealing with my condition, but also the basics of how therapy sessions work, which allowed me to finally get some courage to start it. With the coronavirus pandemic, I'd also been concerned about attending personal sessions, but then I learned about better help in your podcast, and it sounded just perfect for what I needed. I've been getting online counseling from BetterHelp for six weeks now, and I feel like it's been helping me a lot. That's just so wonderful to hear. And now, BetterHelp has a special offer for you. 10% off the first month of sessions if you use this link. Trybetterhelp.com slash selfwork. That's trybetterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash selfwork. I'm never more honored than hearing someone sought therapy after listening to selfwork. And if selfwork is helping you, Maybe better help is your next step. So in thinking of all this, what I decided to do was kind of break down Kahneman's three questions with a step-by-step to-do list, because you know I'm always what to do about it. So we'll look at these five steps about how you can go about testing your gut against reality, looking for patterns and regularity, and then practicing. Here's the first step. Look back over some decisions you've made in the past. List the ones where your gut led you to one place and it was right. Then list the ones where your gut told you to go in one direction and it was wrong. Let's say your gut told you to take a job. It was less money, but you were much more interested in the job itself than what you were doing. Was your gut right or was your gut wrong? After you've done that, look at first the wrong decisions Let's say in this instance you'd underestimated the impact of less money and you had to get a second job, which didn't work out well at all. You became exhausted and sick. The third step is to analyze those wrong decisions. So why did I believe my gut? What made me do that? Maybe you saw your own parents slave away at jobs they hated and you didn't want to repeat that. So you might have been influenced by fear or maybe you're not good with money and didn't think through the bills you actually owed So perhaps impulsivity or non-practicality is an issue. You can see why these whys or what was going on are important. You have to look for themes because these themes hold clues about where your blind spots might be and when your gut could be wrong. I believe what Kahneman is saying is that if you engage in this kind of analysis of your gut decisions, that you'll be learning deliberately and will be much more likely to make better snap judgments. So let's say fear is the theme that you recognize, oh yeah, I was afraid. So the next time your gut wants you to act in fear, you might question it harder. Or if you decide, yeah, I was really ignoring the financial aspect of things, then that theme becomes important. And if your gut leads you once again to ignore finances, you ought to stop. Now the fourth step is to turn around and do the same for the good gut decisions, the ones that worked out. We'll take the same scenario. Again, you stopped working one place and took a job for less money because you were much more interested and engaged in the job. This time, if it was a good gut decision, you figured out how to live on less money and you couldn't wait to get to work every day. Then the fifth step is to write those whys down. Ask yourself the same why question. What made your gut right? Perhaps you were motivated by honoring the value of how you spend your time and you knew how to learn to live on less. So here's the theme again. Your gut was right if the decision involved money because you're good at analyzing that. That's a talent of yours. And then if you're enjoying your work, then that's very high on your list of values. And so if your gut is leading you in the direction of honoring your values, that's probably a pretty good decision. So you can see how identifying what's underneath the why, or as I'm calling the theme, is important to help you make good gut decisions. Now we'll move a bit away from Kahneman and I'll offer five more steps of my own. And this is similar to what we already been talking about, but it's important. Stop telling yourself your gut is always right and instead begin to believe that your gut can actually learn to warn you where your blind spots are. We all have blind spots. Knowing, for example, that you always tend to put others first to the point where you can be easily manipulated into never honoring yourself or you just don't know how to do it very well, then you have to train your gut to help you, to warn you 
wait a minute, this is your blind spot. Rather than leading you to once again do what's instinctive and exhaust yourself in the name of helping others, your gut could say, wait just a second. Is this another situation where I need to stop for a second and think this through? Your gut can help you kind of like a hunting dog. (laughs) Hunting dogs, we'd say in Arkansas. You know, they can lead you to what you're hunting. Here's the second point I want to make. Making mistakes is the only way to learn. It doesn't mean you can't trust yourself if you make a mistake. That's irrational. If you say to yourself, if I make a mistake, I become someone who makes mistakes all the time. Rather, tell yourself, what can I learn from this mistake and how can I remember what I've learned? I often suggest to people that they go back and read in their journal about the time they were making a decision to see what their thinking was or ask a friend, what did you hear me talking about when I made that decision? When you can see your mistake or how you fooled yourself, you can remember that. You can keep that memory handy or if you want to call it a a yardstick, a yardstick for fooling myself, and you keep that handy. That makes making the mistake so worth it because you will learn and remember. Number three is you want to watch out for people who are manipulative and want to undermine your own sense of reality. That's called gaslighting, and I did an entire episode on that, episode 127, in fact. I'll have that in your show notes. And gaslighting can do great damage to your sense of self-trust, and trusting your own intuition. Number four, risk making choices in the first place. I know that there are many people who are terrified of risk. Oh, I could never do that. I'm not brave enough or smart enough, or I could never find the energy. But the real issue isn't about being brave or smart or energetic. It's actually fear of risk. But just think about it. If you're going to trust that something you want to do is worth it, it usually involves doing something new, unfamiliar. You already trust yourself for the things you do that are known to you. You got that down. When you say, I trust myself, it suggests moving ahead into the unknown and risking finding your courage even though you're afraid. And here's number five. Claim your worth and experience. I don't know how often I ask someone, what are you good at doing? What are your strengths? And I get a blank stare. Some think it's egotistical to claim your worth. I say no. It's not egotistical to know what you're good at doing or what you do well. Now, if you need everyone to see it and applaud it, talk about you all the time and put you on a pedestal, then sure, that can get a bit sketchy and become way too big of an ego because you need that attention. But claiming your worth is very different. Write down your positive attributes, know them, and trust them. As you do that, then your gut will respond and remind you, hey, this is a strength of yours. Go for it. So in a quick recap, as you can see, this whole trusting your gut thing may take some time. But it sounds as if there are three questions you want to be able to answer yes to. Is this an area where patterns actually do exist? Do you have lots of experience with this subject? And have you tested your understanding of it against reality in the past? You can use the steps I provided to figure that out and then also work on accepting and working with your blind spots, learning from mistakes and remembering them, that yardstick we talked about, making sure you're not around others who will intentionally undermine you, knowing that you have to risk the unfamiliar so your trust in yourself can actually grow. You're not just doing the same thing over and over and over. And then last is to claim what you do know. All are vital to learning to trust that gut of yours. The listener email today really, really touched me. It's very eloquent. It's a little bit long, but here we go. Unlike most of the email that you probably get, I'm writing to you from a good place emotionally. I have a terrific therapist who's helped me a great deal Or perhaps more accurately, he's given me some important tools, insights, and encouragement so I can help myself. I consider myself fortunate to have found him, but that process wasn't easy. I was working with another therapist and had to make an anguished decision to switch when working with her began to feel torturous and contentious. Here's some background. 
I am 57, and I've felt a sense of shame my entire life. To make a long story short, it's caused me to close up emotionally and to cope by embarking on a series of different obsessive interests, many of which were helpful in contributing to my success. About 20 years ago, though, I started watching and found myself addicted to internet porn. More recently, the addiction expanded to visiting massage parlors, at which point my wife and I started individual and couples counseling. We located a counselor online through her well-designed website, which emphasized her expertise in problems involving relationships, infidelity, and sex and porn addiction. Shortly after starting therapy with her, she urged me to join a local 12-step group for sex addicts. I resisted because it didn't feel right for me. I had read much of the literature on sex addiction, including several of Patrick Carnes' books, and they are wonderful books, by the way. And he says, I made research into sex addiction and recovery, another of my obsessions. And I believe that several of the 12 steps were inconsistent with long-held beliefs I had, and even current feelings, especially the ones about trusting in a higher power and being powerless over addiction. The therapist guilted me into joining the group anyway, and I did go to several meetings, but I never felt a fit. There seemed to be some serious differences between the other members and me. When I reported this to the therapist, she repeatedly tried to shame me into continuing with them. By then, I had begun to recognize the role that my underserved sense of shame had been playing in my life, and the therapy became torturous for me. I wanted to get past the shame, and in each therapy session, I was being immersed in it. When I recognized the negative feelings that I was developing for my therapist, I started thinking about changing therapists, but then... I wondered whether my feelings about the 12-step group and my thought of switching therapists were a kind of self-sabotage. On one level, switching therapists felt like giving up. I'd always heard of people who switched therapists or doctors to try to find one who would tell them what they think they want to hear, and I didn't want to be one of those people. Ultimately, it was my wife who helped me make the decision to find a new therapist. She didn't feel a connection to this therapist either, who was treating both of us individually and as a couple. So we embarked on a search for a new therapist. We'd watched several videos of other prominent therapists whose approach we liked, and we decided to contact some of them for recommendations. I'm omitting a hundred details that are more important to me than they would be to you or your listeners, but the bottom line is that I am now well into recovery. I enjoy and look forward to my now once-a-month sessions, and I'm happier than ever before. The decision to change therapists made all the difference for me, and I suspect that many of your listeners would benefit from your discussion of the process. I love your podcast. It provides a basis of social and emotional learning that my shame-based personality had never previously absorbed and is a valuable public service. So thank you, and please keep up the great work you're doing. This listener's email was so eloquent and painfully described his situation that I have read all of it to you. And actually, here's what I'm going to do. This will be the topic for the next self-work. What to do when therapy isn't going well and may actually be leading to harm. I've got several ideas about it. And I decided as I read the email and thought about how I was going to discuss this with him, I thought, no, I'm going to do a whole podcast on this because it's so important. So now you know what episode 210 will be all about. It will be about when you have conflict with your therapist. Also, just one more note. There are a lot of therapists who see couples and then will see both people individually. I have done that a handful of times over the years, and almost all the time it turns out to be a really bad decision on my part. So I would be very careful with therapists who want to do that. It can negatively affect the process because one or both of them don't tell me their whole story because they know that I have to bring it up to the other. And so it can lead to a lot of confusion. I know you can feel over-therapized, but really both of you should have your own individual therapist and then go to a therapist together. That's really best, in my opinion, and from my painfully learned perspective. Thank you so, so much for being here today. You don't know how much your ratings and reviews mean to me. I read every one of them. The most recent on Apple Podcasts was from a woman, I believe she was a woman, who was getting her master's in psychology, and she talked about how 
pertinent self-work was to her work there, but also she felt as if it was great for those people just being introduced to the world of psychology and emotional well-being. So thank you so very much for that. I love hearing when therapists are actually using self-work with their own patients. It makes me smile. And then I have a book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, How to Break Free from the Perfectionism that Masks Your Depression. This is really a book for anyone who has issues with control. Controlling what you look like, controlling what you act like, or trying to control what other people think about you. Because that very control can lead you to deny or discount painful feelings, silent feelings that you simply don't allow yourself to ever reveal or discuss. There are over 60 exercises in the book, so it's really more of a workbook. And I so appreciate the ratings and reviews people have left me there. It's growing almost every day, certainly every week. And as I've said in several podcasts, all of you are my best marketing team. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. There are lots of ways to reach out to me. My website is drmargaretrutherford.com. And if you subscribe there, you can get both this weekly podcast and blog posts in a weekly newsletter. So it's a really easy way to keep up with me and what I'm doing. I'll also include the occasional You Get the Gists we have. Those are fun for me to do, little five-minute blurbs. You can email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com, and I will read your email if I don't answer all of them. I'm also over on Instagram at Dr. Margaret Rutherford and having fun over there. I'm on Pinterest. And of course, I have my own Facebook professional page at, again, Dr. Margaret Rutherford, where I feature my work. But also, when I find articles that I really think are special, I'll include those there as well. And one more place, I have a Facebook closed group. We have 2,500 members now from all over the world. It's very welcoming and diverse, and I'd love to have you there. That's facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. Thank you again for being here. Please take very, very good care. Stay safe and sound. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self-Work.